The subject that is set before us of this hour is obedience to the gospel. I suppose one of the saddest statements etched upon the pages of the New Testament is found in Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 16, wherein the Bible says they have not all obeyed the gospel. If we were to take bookends in the lovely book of Romans, Romans 1, 5 and Romans 16, 26, here we have in both of these the idea of obedience of the faith, all nations. Really, it's tied to the Great Commission, of which we spoke of earlier in our Bible class. In Mark, the 16th chapter, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? Yes, the gospel includes the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord, according to the scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And all things related to Christ and his teaching while on earth. And all things the apostles taught. In fact, Paul said, the things I write unto you, they are as of the commandments of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14 and 37. So Jesus is going, he is telling the apostles that they are going to go and preach or declare the good tidings of the gospel. And in doing so, people are to believe and to obey, or that is, be baptized. And in doing so, that's going to put them into a relationship that is referred to as saved. The lovely song our excellent brother sang this morning, leading us. The redeemed, and how that the Lord at the cross sealed my heart. It is true that Romans is teaching us the great proof that the true Jew today is not of the physical lineage, but is of the spiritual lineage, that he is the seed of Abraham, and he received the promise, therefore. Now, as we go through Romans this morning, or at least gently survey it, I want us to have in the back of our mind the whole morning, I want to ask the question, and you answer it to yourself personally. Have you individually obeyed the gospel? On one occasion, a man told me, he said, I've never heard that phrase. He said, I've never heard obey the gospel. He says, how in the world could you obey the gospel? Well, the gospel has facts to be believed. It has promises to be received. It has commands to be obeyed, and it has warnings to be heeded. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, that if we do not obey the gospel, and we know not God, we shall be punished with everlasting destruction and from the presence of his power and his holy angels. We must pay attention to the obedience of the gospel. So when Jesus sends out the apostles, and they're going to go to all nations, Matthew 28, all the world, Mark 16, Romans 1, 5, Romans 16, 26. You see the book ends? The obedience of all nations to the faith. That's what we desire. That's what God desires. The first thing you have to do is understand God does genuinely love you and care for you. That's why he sent his only begotten son, John 3 and 16. Not his one and only. That's a whole other discussion for another day. But his only begotten is the proper terminology there. For God's love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should, whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, through his son Jesus the Christ, who was God in the flesh, John 1 and 14, came to seek and to save the lost, Luke 19 and 10. And while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8, Christ died for the ungodly. Remember your book ends. Obedience, obedience to the faith. The word faith there is not your personal faith. It's put in the objective sense. That is the faith that was once delivered, the gospel. That's why the apostles were going to go and preach what? The gospel or the faith or the system or operation of the scheme of redemption. And 
God desiring strongly that all men would come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. That's his will. That's his will. It's not his will that any of us should perish. Second Peter tells us, God is not willing that any man should perish. But his desire is that we would come to a saving knowledge of the truth. That is a fundamental. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad you're here. There is a fundamental difference between what Calvinism teaches and what the Bible properly teaches. We need to be preaching this upon the housetops. People ought to know that they have the ability to come to God and to choose God and to live a better life and be saved by God. You have that ability within you. No matter what state you're in in life, no matter whether you are uh, deep in sin, no matter whether or not you have ever heard the gospel or not, you have the ability, if you seek him, to finally hear the gospel. If you want to hear it, we'll help you with that. You have the ability through the help of God, through the teaching of the, of the scripture, the cross of Calvary, you have the ability to access salvation this morning. But there are some people who believe that God, looking down the telescope of time, individually selected some people to be saved and other people he individually condemned. He did not choose them. That's Calvinism. That's the root. That's the root of an unjust God if it were true. And it's not true. God is willing that all men everywhere repent and prayerfully come to him. That's his desire. That's his mindset that he wants all of humanity to be saved. But here's the truth this morning, young people. Here's the earth-shattering, absolute crux of the matter. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. Have you obeyed the gospel? Obedience to the gospel is really the narrative and the theme of Romans. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, dynamite, dunamis in the Greek, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, the Jew first, and also the Gentile or Greek. Romans 1, 5, Romans 16, 26 bookends. The theme really is the power of the gospel without partiality to both the Jew and the Gentile. And the just shall live by faith. What faith? That system of faith. What system of faith? The one that was made possible, Romans 1, 4, that he, Christ, was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. When we preach a crucified Christ and a resurrected Christ, the gospel, after his burial, resurrected, ascended back, ascension, and set down at the right hand of God where his coronation took place, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Revelation 17, 14, when we teach the Messiah and the Master, the crucified Son of God, when we teach him, we're teaching just what the book of Romans taught. That there is now no distinction between Jew and Gentile. That there is, there is no real reason for any of us to stay outside of Christ. I'm going to tell you something, young ladies. If you're looking to marry in the future, personally, I wouldn't marry somebody that had not obeyed the gospel. How are you going to live in submission and to raise your family in the fear of God, struggling with a man who, who does not put God first because he's not even in Christ. Now, if you've already married, you've got to stay with him. 1 Peter 3, work out the best way you can through your example, through your life. Teach, lead him to the place that finally he can be taught. But I'm just telling you, when you learn about how important it is to obey the gospel and how important it is to start a legacy and to leave your children and your grandchildren with an understanding of real Christianity, I'm saying the best, the ideal, is to marry someone who has obeyed the gospel. You want to be a good father? You want to raise children and grandchildren up that are dignified with integrity, that live and conduct themselves as Christians someday? then they have to obey the gospel. Your children and grandchildren have to see in your life that more important to you than anything else is the gospel. And that's why the theme of our lesson today, Romans 1 and 16, 
What a way to start the meeting off. God's power to save. It's the gospel. The Jew first, the Gentile. And who is the real Jew? That question could be asked in Romans, the second chapter. And it ends by ultimately saying this. The real Jew today is the one that is in Christ. The one that has been baptized into Christ is the one that's a recipient of the promise of Abraham. And an heir to the promise of life. But I want to also look before we move there, the latter part of chapter 1. Do you know why it's so important for us today to promote the gospel obedience? Do you know why it's so important for us to preach Christ to the masses? It's because so many people are living under the burden and shackle and imprisonment of Satan, being servants to sin, and living in the works of the flesh, being alienated from God. In fact, Romans says they had become so foolish, so foolish, they were worshiping the creature over the creator. Sounds a whole lot like today. Romans 1 is a graphic illustration, one of many places in your Bible that depicts the vile and gross behavior of homosexuality. It calls it evil. It calls it vile affections. It calls it unnatural. But see, some people like today, like then, are implacable. What does that word mean? They're unreasonable. You can't hardly reason with them about these things because their mind has been desensitized, darkened, and alienated from the things of God. So they really believe the lies they live. Tell y'all something. You want to save America? We better get back to preaching old-fashioned gospel lessons. Amen. We better be inviting our friends and our neighbors. We better be educating people on what it means to obey the gospel. Why? Romans 10 and 16 says they have not all obeyed the gospel. Sometimes I visit places or watch online, this and that. You've really got two basic types of preaching among our people today. You've got what I call the rehash of the sports. Kind of like could be taught in any religious place in the world type preaching. A little of this, a little of that, and a whole lot of nothing. Or you've got what I call fundamental book, chapter, verse. Present the gospel and let the spirit who works only through the word, Ephesians 6, 17, do the pricking and the convicting and let men and women decide where they want to live eternally. We only have two places this morning. I want you to think about it. This stings for me because I've got people in my own family that really aren't living right. Is that the case with you too? Wouldn't most of us be able to say this morning, we have friends and family and business constituents and people that we know and love that we know are not right with God. Well, we can either not preach the truth or we can go ahead and preach the truth and hope and pray that their heart will be softened. They will receive the word, Acts 2 and 41, and obey the gospel. So here we are in Romans chapter 2. After that list in Romans 1 of all of those horrendous sins, and the Bible says that we are also guilty if we approve of those sins. You don't have to practice them to be guilty. If we even approve of them, we're wrong. And Romans 2 reminds the Jews and the Gentiles that anyone who practices these things are wrong. They're a reminder of the church at large. We are not merely to point the world and say they need to repent. We need to make sure that we're living right. O oh, thou man art inexcusable. Who? Who judgest another who doeth the same things. One time I was preaching that. Before I could get the last part of that out, someone said, Amen. I thought I was saying, Don't judge. No. The Bible doesn't say, Don't judge in a blanket statement. Watch it again. O oh, thou man who art inexcusable, who judgest another, who doest the same thing. What's condemned in Romans 2 is hypocritical judgment. One is calling somebody else out while he himself is engaged in the same sin. We need a righteous judgment, John 7 24. We need judgment that's fair across the board to all people without partiality. Judgment based upon the facts and not he said, she said. And here's the truth. Any of us 
When we're guilty of sin, we're wrong. I don't care what color of skin we are. I don't care whether it's male or female. I don't care whether we're rich or poor. When we sin, we're wrong. And preaching should be the one place in the universe, in the pulpits of the church of Christ, that we know it's fair. And the word of God is going to be preached. And when we need to hear it, we need to hear it. Well, Romans chapter 3, Paul is anticipating, no doubt, the Jewish thought. Well, if this is the case, if we're not a Jew by our ancestry, if that doesn't bring us into this new covenant because we're children of Abraham, then what advantage would it be to even be a Jew? Paul says, well, you've had many advantages. Chiefly, if we were to hone in on one particular aspect of it, Paul says, chiefly, you were given the living oracles of God. You had the living word of God. You had the very oracles. It was given unto you. Truth is, the Jews then, just like the church today, becomes at ease in Zion. And we need to be careful. And we need not to stagger concerning the promises of God. You know, one of the reasons I obeyed the gospel, not the only reason, several reasons. I wanted my sins washed away. I wanted, I wanted to be able to be in the fellowship of the church of Christ. I also wanted to make heaven my home. In Romans chapter 4, Abraham, the Bible says, staggered not at the promises of God because he believed and was also persuaded that he, God, was also able to perform what he had spoken. Do we believe that the promises of God are etched in eternity? Do we believe strongly that his word is kept? In other words, we are going to obey the gospel and live our lives no matter what the persecution, no matter what people say, because we know that what is to come is greater than what we live in here and the now. We look at the things, 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, that are unseen, for the things which are seen are what? Temporal. And the things which are unseen are eternal. I'm looking forward to that heavenly home. And I hope heaven is at least one incentive for you to light a fire under you, to motivate you to press on, press on, press on. Have you obeyed the gospel? Well, in chapter 3, we also learn this sad and shattering thought. All men, Listen to this. All men have come short of the glory of God. All men have sinned. Man has a problem. You cannot go to a shrink and correct this problem. You cannot go to a pharmacist and correct this problem. You cannot go to some high profile attorney and correct this problem. See, we got a lot of ways to correct a lot of problems in life, right? But there's one thing that we cannot do we cannot go outside of Christ and the Word of God to correct sin problem. The problem of sin can only be corrected by God, the Son, through Calvary, and that divine heart. And that's why we take the time and we hope to lay out not only the gospel, the need to obey the gospel, and the promises associated with obeying that gospel. But unless we obey that gospel, Paul said earlier that we'll be punished with everlasting destruction. So here we are in Romans, the fifth chapter. Listen to this. God commended his love for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. There's not, in my opinion, a more beautiful verse. Oh, yes, it's poetic. Oh, yes, it has a nice ring to it. But the content and the meaning of those words deep down in your soul, when the hour of calamity comes, ought to be a great hope for you. God loved you and acted in his great mercy while we were yet stooped in sin. Now that does not mean that God is going to arbitrarily overlook our sin. That does not mean that God is going to, to simply forget about our sin haphazardly. Sin has to be accounted and answered for every sin. Sometimes we think we get by with things on earth. You go 10 miles an hour too fast and well, the cop didn't see me. 
or he let me go. So we think that God is like that. We think that, well, there's things maybe he didn't see. You don't think God saw that? He knows the very hair, the numbers of hair on your head. He knows all things about you. You really don't think that he knows everything and every thought and every intent of our thoughts, Hebrews 4 and 20. He knows everything about us. We can't hide from God. When he asked Adam, where art thou? He wasn't asking for his location. It's a rhetorical question. Adam, where are you spiritually? And he asked us that question today. How many of us would be ready right now if we were to pass away? I mean right now. Is there something you'd probably want to confess before you were taken from this life? Is there a possibility that you'd want to make something right to someone? Is there a possibility that you'd want to be baptized for the remission of your sins? I'm going to tell you all something. We need more preaching on the eternal value of the soul. Have you obeyed the gospel? So here it is in Romans chapter 6. Listen to this. These Jews... And other people as well had a gross misunderstanding of New Testament doctrine. Some who had become Christians were now struggling with this theology. Does this sound familiar today to anybody? What is the theology misunderstood? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Does this sound familiar to anybody today? Sometimes we've got congregations that almost advertise their sin. At so and so congregation, come as you are. We're all imperfect. Come here. You'll fit in. We're all just sinners. I don't know where this came. In my lifetime, I don't know how this started. There's not one Bible passage in the New Testament that identifies by description a child of God as a sinner. Not one. But there is 53 times, Brother Weiser, that Christians are referred to as saints. When Paul wrote the Church of Christ at Philippi, he wrote to the bishops, the deacons, and all the saints in Christ Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Saint means separated ones. We know we make mistakes. That's not the point. The point is, 1 John 1 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But we do not glory advertise and identify with sin. Y'all see the difference? We are supposed to be living sanctified lives. No wonder we're not growing in some places. We're telling the world, you don't, we're so desperate for growth, you don't even have to change to come here. Oh, that's bad. You want your grandkids to be saved? They're going to have to obey the gospel and change their life or they will not be saved. Sometimes we have overly relaxed the teaching in hopes that sometimes we can garner the masses. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way and few there be that find it. Now we want everybody to be saved, but we cannot overly relax the standard and we don't add to the standard. We uphold the standard. And that standard, the word that Jesus spake, John 12 and 48, shall judge us all in the last day. Have you obeyed the gospel? If you have, you should not be, as Paul said in Romans 6, you should not be asking this question. Can we continue in sin that grace may abound? Oh, the grace of Romans 5, 8. The grace of God that allowed Christ to come down. If that's the case, if the law of righteousness, if that Old Testament law has been taken out and the new law of faith, they were thinking, well, maybe then we could just sin more and we would get some more grace. That's how some of my brethren behave. Some brethren, with all due respect, and I came here to preach, some brethren tip the alcohol to their lips, view pornography, go out dancing and clubbing. Some of these ladies wear dresses way up here. Some of you men wear shirts or don't have a shirt on, trying to show off your muscles, running around town. See, we're Christians. When we are a Christian, we belong to Christ, not ourselves. Our old identity should have been buried. 
If we continue to live as the world, pray tell me, why would they see any difference in us? We're to be light of the world. We're not to live as sinners live. We're to be the light. Ye are light. Ye are salt. You're to be blameless as sons of God. We are to be the city upon a hill, the church of the New Testament. We are to be a beacon of truth in a dark world. Yes, we make plenty of mistakes even when we strive the best we can. But if we relax this standard, what ends up happening is people simply do what they want to do. And we become our own gods. And that's idolatry. And Paul said we are to beware of idolatry. Now look at this. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Here's how Paul answered. Holy Spirit by Paul. God forbid. They that are dead to sin should not live any longer therein. When you're baptized into Christ, young people, just like Christ died for your sins, you die to your sin. That's repentance. He had nothing to repent for. He was blameless. He was holy. But when we are baptized, we have to die to ourself and lose our own identity. We can't be raised to walk in new life, Romans 6, 4, if we don't bury the old man first. Somebody has to die for somebody to live. The new man wants to live, but he can't live if we don't bury the old man. Romans 7 is a beautiful teaching. But right before we start Romans 7, I want you to glance down at Romans 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through the first Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the first Adam brought forth death. The last man, referring to Christ, triumphed the sin. That is, we hope not in Adam, we hope in Christ, because the last one brought us life. And this morning, if we will obey the gospel, oh my, what privileges, what rewards, what promises, what help from on high providentially is made possible to each one of us. God wants you to be saved, but he will not. I can tell you this, right? I've studied the Bible for 25 years. And anyone who's done the same with an honest heart, God does not make exceptions for people. This isn't like politics. Some wealthy family comes and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I understand the rules, but uh, let me get the checkbook out. God owns it all. He's not impressed with your $2. Right? Not impressed by it. He's not moved by carnality, by earthly things, by power, by man's control, by philosophies of men, by the dollar bill. He's not moved by those things. He wants people that love him to genuinely embrace his truth and that honors the sacrifice of his son and then because of his son's sacrifice he will extend to you full pardon. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 17 then we'll move to 7. The Bible says they had obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Obeyed what? The faith, Romans 16, 26. The faith, Romans 1, 5. The gospel, Romans 1, 16. The death, the burial, and the resurrection, that's where the power is at, the Bible says. Well, in Romans 7, Paul talks about this inner man. He talks about the covenants in Romans 7, 1 through 4, and that we should be married to another. That is, we're not Old Testament Jews. We're not serving through the lineage of Abraham. Now we are married to another, Christ. And as we close this morning, Romans 8 and 1 is where we'll finish. <laughs> there is therefore now no condemnation. The beautiful news about the gospel is Jesus did not come to condemn us because we were already condemned in our sin. There is now no condemnation. But the question is, who is that in reference to? Is it universal salvation forever? Is everybody going to heaven? Oh, it could be a popular preacher if you could preach that. But you'd be a wrong preacher. You'd be a fundamental False teacher. I always ask this question in meetings. I think it's a good point. I try to stir people's minds up a little bit. You ever been to a funeral 
where someone did not make it to heaven? It's a serious question. Have you ever heard a minister say, this person did not obey the gospel and he is not a recipient of eternal life? I very seldom you're going to hear that. What most of the time you're going to hear is preachers kind of start to stretch it. You've been to some, I thought, I don't even know this guy they're talking about. He said, he was a sober, upstanding citizen. Well, he never got his lips off the bottle. But the minister who didn't really know him said he was a sober, upstanding citizen. I don't think he knew the man was an alcoholic. The entire people at the funeral home were under their breath laughing. That's why God is the final judge. But look at Romans 8 1 as we close. There, therefore, is now no condemnation. The question is, in the margin of your Bible, ask this question. Who is uncondemned? Those that are in Christ. You can't get into Christ unless you have obeyed the gospel because it is the power of God into salvation, Romans 1, 16. There's the key. You cannot be uncondemned unless you have your sin remitted. But look at this. Some people become Christians and they go back the ways of the world. So Paul clarifies further and he says, to those who walk not after the flesh, just because you were baptized into Christ does not guarantee your heavenly home. Because you may start walking back after the flesh. And if you do that, what happens? You lose your soul. Like demons, 2 Timothy 4.10 and other people. So the scripture says here that according to Romans 8 and 1, it's the one that's in Christ and the one that walks not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That is the teachings of the spirit. If you're here this morning, and you have never obeyed the gospel. I hope and pray that you will consider that this morning. Now no one can obey the gospel unless they first believe the gospel. Go back to Mark 16, 16. Here's what the apostles were to teach. He that believeth, believeth what? The gospel. How do you know? Verse 15, they were to preach what? The gospel. When they preached the gospel, people would believe the gospel. And they would be baptized, or that is, obey the gospel. We used to sing a song quite a bit. Trust and obey, for there is no other way. Well, when the gospel narrative, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, is reenacted this morning, when someone comes in belief of Jesus, the Son of God, John 8, 24, when someone comes repenting of their sin, turning from it, acknowledging, but turning from it more importantly, and fruits worthy of it. When they come at the mouth, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Acts 8 and 37, making a confession of the name of Christ and his deity towards unto salvation. And finally, they're baptized because nobody can be saved unless they reach the efficacy of Christ's blood. The power to remove the sin is in the blood. It's the cleansing agent. Brother Keeble used as a great analogy years ago in the 1950s. To me, it cannot be improved upon. Preston came home other night. He'd been out working some cattle with me. His shirt was stained up. He gets, I don't know how he gets so dirty. He had more stains on him than you could count. I took the shirt. I took the tide out. I put the Tide, a big old cup of it, on one shirt in the washing machine. But then I turned the water on. Now the Tide had the power to lift the stain. And the water, through that agitating of, of, of the water, gives you access to the power of that soap. And this morning, if you're going to be saved, it's going to be because you have obeyed in baptism the gospel. And that's why when a Roman soldier took a spear and pierced his side, there came out blood and water. And in that washing machine, God's washing machine, y'all know he's not in the dry cleaning business. God don't save people like a dry cleaners. He saves them with that old-fashioned washing machine, so to speak. And when your sin in that washing machine, the blood of Calvary, that efficacy of that blood, removes that stain, and that water, the waters of baptism, accesses by faith the obedience of that gospel. God says, according to Acts 2 and 47, not only have your sins been remitted, verse 38,
But the Lord himself adds you to the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. We hope and pray. I know God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all are awaiting your coming. No doubt they want everyone to be saved. When Christ hung upon the cross, let it not be in vain for you. Answer his call and honor him. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Obey him. He is the author of salvation to those that obey, those that obey him. Your obedience, your obedience did not bring you salvation by itself. Your obedience accesses that salvation for it was God who brought salvation down through Christ. But unless you access it, his sacrifice to you will not, will not bring you salvation. I hope and pray that somebody here today wants to be saved. Have you obeyed the gospel? Think about these things as we stand and as we sing.